Even though it's like brand new? No. Um, yeah, the, okay. the building itself wouldn't be considered historic if, so if it was if it's completely a new rebuild. However, if it's in a local historic district, it is still under the historic district purview. So it still has to go before the commission for certain things, depending on where it is, what historic district it's in. And that's, it, it can be confusing. In New Orleans, we have so many historic districts that some are partial review, partial control, some are full control, some are only, you know, demolition review. Um, so if it's in a full control, it would still have to get, you know, the plans for that house approved. You can't just build anything there. And then if 10 years from now they want to put up a different fence, they would have to go before, you know, the HDLC to be like, this is the kind of, you know, there's only certain types of fences that are approved for the lots in those neighborhoods to try and make it as cohesive as possible. Yeah. And of the 30 some odd percent that of structures that are in local historic districts, I would say more than half of them are in districts that are only demolition review. So the level of, hmm. of kind of hmm. design review that Michelle was just talking about is restricted to a much smaller percentage of the cityscape. Gotcha. So if you're in, uh, go to Lower Nine, you go through Holy Cross, that's one district that's just on the river side of St. Cloud Avenue in Lower Nine. Uh, Bywater, you'll probably drive right through or past Bywater. That's one where you do have that level of design review. Obviously the French Quarter, parts of this downtown, but not all of it. But then the, the large residential areas around Ottoman Park and City Park are only demolition review. So they don't want you to tear down something that is considered historic. But if somebody rebuilt after Katrina and you wanted to tear it down now, they would let you do that. That wouldn't be a problem. They would say, well, that's not, not historic because it was a, a new construction. What was the shotgun house question? I was just wondering why they were shaped like that. So we actually talked to yeah. a couple of students, where were they from? Um, oh shoot, that was like a month ago. <laughs> that were doing a documentary on shotgun houses um, and Nathan touched a lot on this, but they, for the lot size, they were trying to fit as many people into the lots as possible. And so they were just like skinny lots. Um, I'm actually writing a house history on one right now where, you know, in 1896, there were five houses on these big lots. Um, and by 1908, it was, originally square. it was, yeah, it was just a square and they, you know, divided it up. And then, you know, 15 years later, it had been divided into 30 lots, you know, and they just kind of cut it straight across and then fit it in with as many, these were actually double shotguns and each half of the double is on its own lot. Um, so nowadays, most people own their full double, but um, when they were, you know, they were trying to sell them off as, to fit as many people as possible. So um, it really was just mostly land space. Um, it also had to do with air conditioning, like Nathan hit on, you know, the um, straight back, you could open the front door and the back door, you had transoms above to get that cool air and hot air out and cool air in as much as possible. And how it's made. Yeah, if you ever see, or if you, or Google, you can find a map of the colonial era settlements along the Mississippi River, mm -hmm. the lower Mississippi River. Mm -hmm. uh, what the French and Spanish did was carve up the land to give as many property owners, mostly plantation owners, uh, a bit of river frontage. And then they would just draw the lines basically straight right. back, right? So everybody needed to be able to access the river to get their goods to market. And most arable land was gonna be closer to the river and that going away from it was probably gonna be more wetlands and swamps, right? But it was that, that same concept of like squeezing in frontage along the thoroughfare, in that case, the river, that then later is translated into the urban environment and we're squeezing in right. street frontage along the streets as we build them. Um, and if you're in the case of a shotgun double, you get two households on one lot fronting the street and oftentimes a one a single story structure. So they were pretty efficient to build. And um, also over time, as people became more affluent, um, they could be dolled up and decorated, but they were still pretty Basically. utilitarian structures. So the facades will have brackets and millwork and some are gonna be like East Lake and some are gonna be arts and crafts, depending on when they were built and what the owners wanted. But it's still a pretty cheap functional stru structure behind it. You know, you only have a little bit of facade and then a lot of pretty plain walls. Mm -hmm. 
So, yeah. So, not, not to get political, if you guys want to get political, but so, um, uh, what's your take on the Make It Right uh, excitement, the Make It Right homes and all of that story? I think <laughs> <laughs> if you want to talk, or you don't have to, if it's too. Well, one, one of the sort of tropes, I don't know how true it is, is that um, uh, by trying to go with Star Architects. Um, Star Architects? I've not heard that. Okay, good. Yeah, Star so like, you know, Frank Gehry and. Yeah, other, yeah, 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 yeah. Big names. Big, big name architects, they um, sort of jettisoned some of the knowledge that would have been more local. Uh, indigenous and local and even in the local architects about what materials weather well here and you know most of the, the homes were are built elevated right. they knew enough not to build you know, at flood risk but um, some of them had flat roofs which was not a great idea right <laughs> and some of the materials that were used I mean this was also the era of Chinese drywalls so some of that was just um, Probably, probably not yeah. unique to make it right, but some of the materials I think have not weathered well um, I think be that's because a lot of it. they were perhaps chosen by people who um, aren't used to our were not, environment. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we're not yeah, yeah. particularly uh, uh, practicing here, right. uh, accustomed to practicing here. And some of it might have then be that the, the nonprofit organization was trying to make its money go as far as possible, so they didn't buy the the highest quality materials. But since they had such a high profile, you know, when they get sued by homeowners, it's, it's very different than when just Joe Blow contractor yeah. gets sued yeah. by someone who built his house for having made some of the same mistakes. Mm -hmm. Well, it seems tough, right? It, se it seems like, you know, in the wake of these disasters, we want to help folks recover and I uh, don't want to send the ill will to folks that are trying to help make things better. But at the same time, how do you, how do you engage those that interest or that passion in a way that is culturally and, and locally um, relevant and I, that, that's hard right especially if people come in with big high profile names and resources and stuff mm -hmm. right it, it, it uh, yeah I just was curious from you know we hear from people in the, in the immediate area but I was just curious from your guys more sort of professional preservationist approach how you how you thought of that that whole endeavor yeah, and, and I agree with Nathan. I think that it's it's difficult because, you know, they did so much good and they built these houses. But like Nathan said, and we have this problem after every hurricane that people come in from other places and they build the exact same as they would in, you know. New York or yeah, anywhere <laughs> anywhere else, even northern parts of Louisiana. And that just doesn't work the same way here. You mm -hmm. have there are different materials you have to use. Things won't last as long if you don't maintain them. Mm -hmm. There's a big, really need to maintain your structures here right. because the sun is just different, the, right. everything. Um, yeah, and that could be part of the, the backstory of the Make It Right debacles is that you know, there was a desire to put people in high quality housing as homeowners, but whether those people had the means and knowledge to maintain it could have been a mixed bag. And if it was, you know, a more complicated building or using less common materials, then you, the, the hill is kind of steeper in terms mm -hmm. of maintaining yeah. the building. So it's yeah. great to have a solar system on the roof, but when it goes on the front, you've got to pay to, to have it repaired. So, um, right. I don't know. Yeah, the, the unsexy stuff of maintenance is, is super important. Totally, right. totally, totally. Other questions, other things you guys are wondering about architecturally or, or preservation-wise? Just out of curiosity, uh, this is a question for both of you. Uh, what is your favorite landmark here in this area? That's always a hard question. <laughs> <laughs> What's your favorite yeah. child? Who's your favorite child? <laughs> <laughs> I only have one child, so that's easy. <laughs> Make <a mess> <laughs> Um, I'm not sure. I well, go ahead. <laughs> I'm going to say um, I have somewhat of obligations since I'm have been on the board of the organization. Um, the Piton House on Bayou Saint John, the, uh, for, it's probably built in the Spanish era, but it's a, like a West Indian French Creole hmm. house fronting Bayou Saint John. There's, there are several up there in that style. That, so that is the style that was brought here. It has like Norman trusses in the roof, brought here by the colonial settlers um, before they had shotguns. So they're oriented the other way. And they do have this sort of environmental wisdom about them in that they had 
a ground floor that uh, was not the main, occup main occupied space. So if there was a, a flood from, in that case, the bayou, most of the furniture and people would be on the second story. Um, and they have external circulation and you can open all the windows and doors and get a breeze through there. They would have put up curtains over what is now what we call the gallery or the upper porch so they could have shade in the summer. So I think because of the, the situation of those houses on the bayou, one, it's just beautiful, they're reflected and you know it's a nice part of town, but it also sort of looks in some ways the most historic mm -hmm. other than perhaps the French Quarter. I mean, obviously you should walk around the French Quarter and that's the historic urban environment, but uh, Bayou St. John is actually part of the reason that the city was built here because they could get ships in and out and the Native Americans sort of had been doing that for generations. So I think that's where I, where I would say. What do you yeah. I, um, I, have, I guess I have two answers, but they're, neither of them are like a specific thing, I guess. <laughs> um, I used to work in construction um, in New Orleans. So my favorite part of that job was being able to go to all of the residences and just seeing all of the different houses. I wouldn't say I have like one big like building in New Orleans that I love. I just love all of the different types of architecture. Like uh, one day I could go into a small shotgun house and the next day I would be like in a mansion on Audubon Park and they're like two blocks away from each other, you know, just the change in architecture. Um, as for like a landmark, when it, you guys will go over the St. Claude Bridge yep. and that's yep. very yep. close to my house. Um, and my husband and I walk up to it all the time. Um, and it was, let me see if I can get this right, but the first like continuous concrete pour in mm. America, like the block that mm. um, is the weight for it. And it was built in 1927. Um, and there's been a lot of talk of taking it down and building a new bridge. And I'm gonna fight <laughs> for a lot of reasons. Um, also because they think construction will take 13 years on it if they were to go. Um, Which would actually be like 26 here, exactly, right? Exactly, yes. Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, But it's just a really cool piece. It was um, built by a well-known architect, and I just think it's like a, a little bit, like it's just cool that it's been there since cool. 1927, and most people in that neighborhood that still live there, our neighbor was built, or was built, was born a year after, and so like, wow. you know, she's heard about when the, you know, when the canal went in, when this, when, when the, um, bridge went in um so i think it's just like a cool little feature of new orleans and my neighborhood specifically so cool and there's an immense amount of concrete in that lock so yeah. there's a lock where this man-made canal that connects the lake meets the river right and the river water levels are often higher than the lake or this canal um, but there's an immense amount of concrete that is at that juncture point i remember seeing construction photos and it um I don't know. I think someone said it's as much as in the uh, Empire State Building. I don't know if that's true, but it's it's it's, it's enormous. <laughs> so from an environmental perspective, concrete is like super polluting, right? Tons of carbon associated with conventional concrete. So when I look at a, a building like Plaza Tower, which is a monstrosity that's been vacant for a long time, but it's a big concrete building, I think that's like too big to fail, right? It might be ugly. It might be falling apart. It might not be the most historic, but from an environmental rationale, those are exactly the ones that yeah. we want to repurpose right. and reuse and totally. renew. Right. Because if we replace them, it's gonna to take tons of pollution with conventional uh, architecture mm -hmm. to create the same amount of square footage, the same, whether it's office or residences or whatever. So that same rationale actually kind of applies to this lock. The Army Corps wants to replace it, but we know that there's tons of embodied energy in the current design. So if yeah. we can make it function rather than replace it, and yeah, the Army Corps doesn't get to manage a project for 20 years, but it's actually probably environmentally the more responsible thing to do. And the other environmental issue that plays in there, as I said, the river levels are often higher than the lake and the canal. So when they build the new lock, the current plan is to move it essentially backwards, further away from the river. Oh, really? So that those higher river levels will come in a portion of the canal behind a new flood wall. And so folks call it bringing the river in closer to our homes. Mm -hmm. And there is concern that if there was ever to be a, a rupture in the flood wall linked to the Mississippi River, it would actually be worse than a rupture in the flood wall linked to Lake Pontchartrain in the Gulf. Totally. Right? totally. Um, so there's a lot of concern in that community because they did flood so badly in Katrina, and this idea of having more 
um, water, closer to houses, and it, you know, it, there's just not, yeah. not a lot of trust for the Army Corps, understandably, yeah. <laughs> and, and not a desire to have this, in, you know, environmental risk placed there. They've been fighting it since the 70s, um, this replacement, and so far it's been successful. <laughs> so we'll see how long they can put it off for. But Cool. Other questions? Okay, then I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna ask my, my, my closer, which is a selfish one. So uh, in the pandemic, I started doing uh, podcasts with my students and stuff um, called the Dew Drop In, named after the Dew Drop In here. Mm -hmm. And um, so last couple of times I've gone by, it's like, you know, basically dead. Um, and I thought it was gonna be demolished, but it sounds like now there's, there's, there's hope to restore, recover. So can you guys give us an update on what the current Delio yeah. with the dew drop in, and so again, if you guys don't know, dew drop in is this place uh, from that historically brought people together, jazz club, and it was a hotel and all this kind of cool stuff where everybody was accepted and could come and hang out. Didn't matter if you were, you know, gay, straight, or or black, white, or whatever. Particularly in time when African Americans were, were traveling, musicians and folks couldn't. Right, we had all the the horrible uh, Jim Crow laws and stuff, and so um, anyway, yeah. But yeah, so so so, but it fell in disrepair. Yes, so my understanding is that there's currently a redevelopment plan and the developer is a guy named Curtis Doucette who has a company called Iris that has been doing housing, mostly new construction housing, maybe some uh, historic renovation. Uh, but I believe they worked with McCrosty. Um, I think Gabrielle and Beth were involved in um, the historic tax credit piece of it, which had been a stumbling block for the prior developer that I spoke with, a guy named Ryan, and um, they were having a hard time figuring out how, if they could use historic tax credits because essentially the hotel portion of the Dew Drop In, not the performance space, but um, it, it was kind of like uh, a shared bathroom at the end of the hall <laughs> and small rooms. And they were like, there's no, you know, they, the zoning would allow them to bring it back to a hospitality use, but they couldn't figure out how to um, keep some of the historic. <laughs> portions that would satisfy the, gotcha. the historic tax credit incentive requirements, not a requirement, but it's an incentive, and also meet the market demand for Modern lodging. Amenities. <laughs> so that was just one of the problems. I think that another problem was that they were not well capitalized and well financed. So the newer new developer, uh, Mr. Doucette, and his, has, has hired a um, different design team and uh, some very well respected uh, historic tax credit consultants. And so I believe they have kind of broken through that barrier. Mm. I don't know how much of it has to do with design versus financing, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. they believe they can get historic tax credits. If you go there, they've removed a portion of the cladding that was over the facade to, okay. to reveal that there is some original, I don't know if it's plaster, or stucco or concrete, um, like an arch door uh -huh. there. Mm -hmm. So that was important to, to know that some of the original facade was there in order to access the gotcha. state and federal historic tax credits to help finance the project. But so that's the, that's what I know about it. Cool. <laughs> cool. Awesome. Well, let's thank these guys, you guys, and, uh, and we'll hang out.